It is the most important issue on the minds of Americans right now, the economy. But in a lot of ways, it is a tale of two economies. I'm Andrew Rafferty. And I'm Libby Casey. This is the premiere episode of Election 22, What Matters? Nearly 10 million jobs, the fastest growth in all of American history. Record growth and record inflation, rising wages, yet fears of a recession. A complicated economic picture hanging over America. It feels like you just have nowhere to go and no one to turn to. Mixed messages with the midterm election now two months away. As far as business is concerned, we're doing very well. This is a Washington Post Newsy Special, Election 22, What Matters? Now, from the Washington Post Newsroom, Libby Casey and Andrew Rafferty. Thank you for joining us for the launch of our new special series, a collaboration between the Washington Post and Newsy. Over the next nine weeks, we are digging in on the nine key issues that will determine the outcome of the midterm elections. At stake, not only the balance of power here in Washington, but the priorities of our government over the next two years. There will be impacts on Americans across the country with the midterm election now about 60 days away. And the economy remains a top concern for voters. Well, that's right. According to Gallup, one in three Americans mention economic issues as the nation's most important problem. That's triple where we were four years ago. And while the cost of everything from food to housing has been rising and gas hit a record high this summer, the price of fueling up at the tank is coming back down and an overwhelming majority of the country thinks now is a good time to find a quality job. So which economic reality will voters side with? Newsy White House correspondent Willie James Inman is in Georgia. Like many Americans, Maika Smoot is cutting back. So when eggs went from 78 cent a dozen to $3.50, $4 a dozen, I decided that I, I, I don't eat eggs. I'm good with no eggs. The cost of eggs is now 38% more than one year ago, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Overall, groceries have gotten 13% more expensive over the last 12 months, the largest annual increase in more than 40 years. But scaling back isn't always possible. Smoot's daughter has dietary restrictions that require pricey specialty food items. This one says it's free from 14 allergens, but the top nine and then you can actually buy these in Kroger. They're a little more expensive. I've noticed with Enjoy Life, if I buy in bulk, um, it's a little cheaper. Rising prices are affecting nearly every aspect of American life, driven largely by energy and food prices, thanks to a combination of labor shortages, global unrest, and the lingering impacts of the pandemic. Small business owners like Ebony Carzo, who runs a boutique wedding cake bakery out of her home, have had to adapt. Her creations have landed her a loyal customer base, along with a spot on a Food Network TV show. But even with all that success, higher operating expenses also means some of those costs get passed down. Have you had to raise prices on some of your customers? Yeah, I've raised prices about 30%. Um, oh, whoa. That's to, a lot. Yeah, to cover uh, not only the cost of inflation, but... Um, some of the other expenses that come along with it, you know, because it's not just ingredients, but everybody is raising their prices. Carso says she's added more pathways of income for her business, like hosting cooking classes and even turning her cooking studio into an event space. She calls it a lesson learned from tough times during the pandemic and is something she hopes will make her business more stable in any possible recession. Even with all the negative news about the economy, there are some bright spots for both of these working moms who live in the Atlanta area. For Carzo, business is booming. So in 2022, my goal was to at least get back to pre-pandemic numbers. And I honestly didn't realize until last month, a month or so ago, that I had surpassed that number. So the good thing is revenue is there and business is growing and booming. But the profit margin is a lot smaller uh, than before. And for Smoot, she refinanced her home earlier this year and tapped into equity after a major increase in her home's value. She used the funds to pay off debt. So to me, that's just me thinking down the road, like not being strapped for cash, not if I need something, I'm able to do it. Um, but just putting myself in a position where if you need it, you have it. To them, a more expensive life is a daily reality. It's one they admit there's no easy fix for, but they just want it to change. 
Libby, this is really an issue that voters will be keenly watching come this midterm election. And that's because a University of Georgia poll found that inflation and rising prices is a top concern for voters here in the Peach State. And it will likely influence how they vote in November. And it's really key because there are two important races here, one between Republican Governor Brian Kemp and Stacey Abrams, a Democrat. That is a rematch between those two candidates and the other race on the U.S. Senate side. You have incumbent and Democrat Raphael Warnock versus Herschel Walker, the Republican challenger. That race is key because it could likely determine the balance of power in the U.S. Senate. Libby. Molly James Inman reporting from Atlanta. We'll chat again as part of our roundtable in just a few minutes. Well, it's just a few months ago, nearly two-thirds of Americans gave President Biden a failing grade on his handling of the economy. Now, the story is shifting, at least a little bit. A recent Quinnipiac poll showed President Biden's approval rating on the economy went up about 10 points between July and August. Latest numbers show his approval rating at 39% on the economy, disapproval rating still at 57%. So, Libby, the question is, will it be enough? Will the economy continue to improve over the next few months? And that's a question I put directly to the director of the White House Economic Council, Brian Deese. What can you tell us about these mixed signals we're getting on the economy? Yeah, absolutely. Look, uh, everything that we're experiencing is unique because we're coming out of a pandemic uh, recession and pandemic economic crisis that forced our entire economy to shut down and come back. And we're dealing with unique global situations, the war in, uh, in Ukraine and the impacts on global energy markets. All of this is unique. But I think to break it down, we ha are coming out of a, a, a historically strong economic recovery. So uh, the labor market recovery, the rapid decline in unemployment, the rapid increase in people getting back into the labor market, all of those are unique. And what we're trying to navigate through here now is a transition to a more steady and stable growth with more uh, predictable prices and uh, prices coming down, but without having to give up all of the economic gains that we've made over the last 18 months. So that's the policy objective here. Uh, and people, I, I, I hope and expect, are seeing some of that benefit in their life, but we have more work to do. And now you've talked about the many benefits of the Inflation Reduction Act, and you could have called it anything. I know the White House didn't pick the name of the bill, but it is called the Inflation Reduction Act. So shouldn't Americans expect to see inflation going down and, and when should they expect to see it? When should they expect to see the actual benefits of this uh, landmark legislation uh, actually impacting their day-to-day -day lives? Well, look, what Amer Americans should expect is that this historic piece of legislation actually lowers some of the costs that they face in their day-to-day -day lives. And so here's when people should expect it. First, on health care. Uh, there are 13 million Americans who, starting next month, uh, will receive letters from their insurers that because of the Inflation Reduction Act, the premiums that they have to pay for health insurance are going to stay low. That'll save families about $800 a year. Second, energy costs. A lot of families are focused on this. Gas prices are coming down, but other energy costs are up. The provisions in this legislation are going to lower families' utility bills, and give them a whole new range of options that when they have to go out to buy anything from a refrigerator to a new heating system, they're gonna get lower costs for more efficient appliances, more efficient elements for their homes uh, and their businesses. That's gonna lower costs as well. And then the third is on prescription drugs, where in addition to capping out-of-pocket costs at $2,000 for Medicare recipients, so that people don't have to pay thousands and thousands of dollars in prescription drug costs, this bill will finally let Medicare, as the largest purchaser of prescription drugs, actually negotiate for better prices. And so all of those things will mean that people will see impacts on the prices that they pay for things like health care and energy and prescription drugs. And at the end of the day, that was the goal of the legislation. I think we'll deliver on that. That was Brian Deese, head of the White House Economic Council. I spoke to him earlier from our Newsy studio. And Libby, one thing that stood out was certainly no timeline on when we should expect those inflation numbers to come down. Well, it has everyone wondering. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's there. No one has a crystal ball, especially at this complex economic moment. Well, a quick break now. And then President Clinton's former Labor Secretary joins us. Why did the rapid growth in the 90s not lead to the same pain we're seeing today?
Plus, perspective from outside Washington. We'll go to Detroit. You're watching Election 22, What Matters. The economy is our focus on this premiere episode of a partnership between The Washington Post and Newsy. Election 22, What Matters. Our next guest is Robert Reich. He served as President Clinton's first labor secretary. He was also a member of President Obama's Transition Advisory Board. He's now a professor of public policy at the University of California, Berkeley. I spoke with him earlier from Newsy Studios here in Washington, D.C. Well, we wanted to have you on because you were instrumental in the Clinton administration, years where we experienced rapid economic growth. In fact, Biden's economy is growing at the fastest pace since the Clinton years, yet we didn't see the same sorts of negative aspects we're experiencing right now. So what was different then and how did you prevent some of the negative impacts that we're seeing playing out in the economy right now? Well, the biggest difference is the pandemic. Uh, this is a pandemic-created inflation that we are enduring. Uh, this is a pandemic, uh, really, recession that we've just come out of. Uh, and so, uh, really, the, we, we haven't had any comparison to what we've been through since the pandemic of the first part of the 20th century. Uh, and I know you've been very vocal about how the Fed has been handling this, specifically on the idea of raising rates. Can you talk us through what your thinking is on that? The Fed uh, is trying to slow the economy to avoid inflation, and I understand that completely. That's what the Fed does. It's what the Fed is supposed to do. Uh, but in doing that, the Fed is looking primarily at jobs and wages. And the assumption is that jobs and wages have made the labor market so tight that it is forcing up prices. That's not the truth. The reality is that prices are being forced up, number one, by supply shortages around the world. Almost every country is experiencing the same kind of inflation we are experiencing. In fact, ours is a little bit less than the typical inflation around the world. But secondly, we're also experiencing price hikes because our big corporations have enough market power to raise prices without suffering uh, just the the loss of, of customers. Uh, they are using inflation as a cover for doing this. We know this because every measure of profit margins, that is the margin above the costs, how much profits there are, continues to grow. Uh, in fact, by some measures, corporations have not had such high profit margins in over 70 years. Okay, so what would you like to see them do instead of raising rates necessarily? Well, I'd like to see Congress. Now, the Fed really doesn't have the kind of control that I'm going to suggest. But I do think we have to think seriously about a windfall profits tax. This is being imposed in, in Great Britain, for example. Other countries are considering it. Uh, we, it it's very simple. It, it, it basically looks at companies' profits over the last five years or ten years, whatever your time area is, uh, and it says, okay, well, the last three years, if it's above that baseline, we are going to tax it by 40 percent, 50 percent, 60 percent, whatever the tax is. Uh, but we're going to assume that those are windfall profits. Those are not coming out of normal uh, profit-making uh, capacities. These are your exploiting uh, the situation that a lot of people are finding themselves in. Uh, these are profits that are not appropriate. They are windfalls to you, and uh, consumers are paying the price. And so what we're going to hear a lot in the fall, specifically from Republicans, but maybe even from some Democrats who are in tough races, is that this is mostly Biden's fault. He overdid it with pandemic relief. Then we have government spending, whether it's the infrastructure bill or more recently, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. So what is your reaction to that? How much of this is squarely on the White House? Well, I don't think uh, much at all uh, is on the White House. Uh, Joe Biden has handled it uh, extraordinarily well. Uh, in fact, uh, the Joe Biden White House uh, has 
done a lot of things that will actually reduce inflationary pressures. Uh, for example, giving Medicare the authority uh, to negotiate drug prices and get drug prices down. Uh, that's an enormous uh, boon to consumers. It also means that uh, inflationary pressures are reduced. Uh, that's a good thing. That's former Labor Secretary Robert Reich. And Andrew is back here with me in our studio. We are also joined by Washington Post economics correspondent Abba Badarai. In Atlanta, Newsy White House correspondent Willie James Inman. And in Dearborn, Michigan, Jim Kurtzner of WXYZ TV. Willie, let's get right to it. You have been talking to voters all around Georgia. Any indication of how the economy is going to impact their vote? Hey there, Libby. Well, if you really listen to voters down here in the Peach State, they they tell me that essentially they're not either making enough or they're already preparing for a potential recession. And they're looking at this through the lens of what can political leaders do for me? I spoke with a teacher in the piece that was featured on this show, and she essentially told me while she's thankful of the governor's raise that she received $2,000, if you divide it by 12 months, it's just simply not enough to make up for inflation. So people are essentially essentially just cutting back on everyday things, Libby, uh, things they, that we often take for granted, like buying eggs or uh, going to a theme park, taking a trip, driving down the road, uh, taking a joyride. People aren't doing those everyday things because prices are just simply too high. Let's go to Jim in Michigan. You know, President Biden came into office vowing to boost unions and blue collar jobs. What has the experience been like, Jim, in these past two years for auto industry workers in the Detroit area? It's been a tough two and a half years for the entire auto industry, partially because of the economy. But first off, with COVID-19, these plants in Michigan and in other states closed in March of 2020. They started to reopen in May, but they had one shift of workers. They're still having a tough time making all the cars that they could because of the ongoing chip shortage. That's a whole nother conversation. And Michigan is a lot like Georgia, going through the same issues with inflation and high gas prices. Very much on the minds of voters as we go into midterm elections here in Michigan, both with races for Congress as well as statewide races here in Michigan for governor, attorney general, and secretary of state. Yeah, do you have a sense of who people are blaming? You know, it, often politicians, they, they bear the brunt of this. So who are people telling you that they're holding accountable and how might that impact which way they decide things in a couple months? In this state, it all depends on which side of the aisle you're talking to a voter. If it's a Republican voter, it's all about Joe Biden and it's his fault. If you're talking to Democrats, they're saying it's just a, a situation with COVID and everything that COVID touched in the economy. And that's the ripple effects from that. So this is a very divided state right now here in Michigan. And those are the kinds of answers you're going to get. Abba, you know, there are so many mixed signals right now on the economy. So what indicators are you watching to get a sense of where things are going? You know, Libby, what makes this particularly confusing is that a lot of indicators show that the economy is actually very strong. People have jobs, consumer spending remains very robust, and by many measures, things are great. But the big storm cloud looming over this is inflation. It's wiped out many wage gains that workers have seen, and it's really making it difficult for people to afford day-to-day -day essentials like gas and groceries. So I'm so curious about how the effects of these bills that have been passed from the you know, uh, Inflation Reduction Act to infrastructure spending are actually hitting people's lives and what the timeline might be for people to feel the effects of that potential spending. You know, these are all longer term plays. And so these impacts haven't hit American families yet for the most part. And it could be months, if not years, before they start to see um, some of these impacts ripple through. Uh, some of the economists I talked to said that the first thing that Americans might see from the Inflation Reduction Act is faster tax returns. And so we're talking really piecemeal um, changes along many months and perhaps even years. And so, of course, Andrew, that brings us to the question of what can be done in two months' time. So Democrats are trying to figure out how much these changes can be hitting people. In the short term, we heard from Brian Deese about how he believes the economic picture has improved. How confident are Democrats that things can get better in two months? And do they need to for them to see success? Yeah, well, Libby, I don't think they're overly confident, especially on the question of inflation. And then there was Joe Biden himself on Labor Day talking about the economy, wrapping it all in and all this 
positive uh, sort of headwinds that he has seen. But when he talked about inflation, it was a little bit of a different story. Take a listen. The bottom line is jobs are up, wages are up, people are back to work, and we're seeing some signs that inflation may be, maybe, I'm not overpromising, may be beginning to ease. So maybe, 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 and when the question of how important is it, well, I mean, when you talk about the economy, there's really two factors that have a bigger significance politically than anything else. Number one is unemployment, and number two is inflation. And I was just going through some of the polling, and one economist survey asked people, what is the number one indicator for how the economy is in your life? And it was not stocks, it was not how your 401k is doing, uh, it was not unemployment, it is the cost of goods, a majority of the Country. That is how they are judging whether the economy is good or bad right now. Well, thank you so much to all of you. An important discussion as the midterm election is just about 60 days away. Willie James Inman in Atlanta, Jim Kurtzner in Detroit, Abba Batari and Andrew Rafferty here in Washington. Well, Andrew and I will be back in just a moment for some final thoughts and we'll serve up a quirky economic fact about the fast food industry. Sometimes you have to see to believe and witness history as it unfolds. When the news is breaking, watch with the newsroom of the Washington Post. We explain what's happening and why it matters. Thank you for choosing to watch the headlines as they're being written by our journalists. You can subscribe with a special offer at WashingtonPost.com slash watch. Subscribing through that link lets everyone here from the front lines to the control room know that you care about our continued efforts to inform the public, protect the First Amendment, and foster a healthy democracy. We could not do this without you. When is the last time you grabbed something at the drive-thru? Turns out more of us have been. Restaurants that specialize in takeout and drive-thru have experienced a sustained boom over the past year. While sales at all restaurants are up, these limited service restaurants are leading in sales this year compared to last. The industry publication QSR says we are in a quote, golden age of fast food. So Andrew, Americans are getting out to eat, but they're looking for savings. Right, and I think I've been doing my part to help bring about this golden age of fast food. But look, we heard a lot this over this past half hour about how Americans are scaling back, mm -hmm. trying to cut back on their expenses, changing their lifestyle. Uh, one big point that shouldn't get lost in all this is how the party that could potentially take control of power, Republicans, what would they do about it? I know Kevin McCarthy later this month is supposed to bring out a special kind of contract to America mm -hmm. style uh, promise on what he would do. So how much will that resonate with voters, do they really even need a plan? Do uh, voters potentially want to know what they would do? I think that shouldn't get lost. In Sometimes it's easier to be the pa party in the minority mm -hmm. because you can point fingers and make criticisms, but yes. you also have to come up with a plan that voters can can yes. latch onto and see. Well, thanks so much, Andrew, and to our guests for this half hour for digging into our economic reality, an issue that's sure to drive the midterm election. Next week, we turn to education. From local school boards to governor's races, we will get educated in the fierce battle underway right now. Thank you for watching the premiere of Election 22, What Matters, from the Washington Post and Newsy.